I love meat. Yeah? So do you think that the enjoyment of something justifies causing harm to animals? Oh, are we out of time? Oh, we are out of time. Oh, I've got to go, otherwise we get booted off air. I'm very, very sorry about oh, all of this, but there we go. We'll have to get you back on. Thank Absolutely. you very much, though. Much appreciated. You're welcome, And I appreciate you coming into Absolutely. the studio. Thank all right, you take very care. Much. Uh, right. A new study from researchers in Israel has revealed that tomato plants scream when they're picked from their stems. Scream when they're picked from their stems. What is going on everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the My Gardener channel. In today's episode, I have a very exciting harvest video planned for all of you, and it is coming through here and picking the bulk majority of our fall aromas. Now, a lot of you have asked a lot of questions about fall tomatoes, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to answer some of those questions, as well as kind of just show you what I'm expecting to get from my fall tomatoes. Scream when they're picked from their stems. And so every single tomato is beginning to ripen. Now I've been picking from all these plants pretty much for the past week and a half, two weeks now. But this plant right here was a little bit late to the game. They kind of all started ripening. They kind of all started ripening uh, at the last second. And Scream check when they're picked this. from their stem. Oh, you guys, look at this. Look at this. Oh my gosh. It's absolutely ridiculous. How many tomatoes? <laughs> Look at that. It's just, it's obscene how many tomatoes are on these plants. Absolutely, I mean, it's just, it's just obscene. So they emit airborne sounds similar to bubble wrap being popped. Filling up this crate here. And look at these tomatoes. Just check those out. They're beautiful. And the plants are so loaded down. Now the third question we get asked all the time is, Luke, how come you didn't stake your tomatoes up? The answer is because we didn't really have to. With determinants, they're gonna be growing to a determined height, they're gonna put out a determined uh, amount of fruit, and they're pretty much going to just kind of die after they're done fruiting. So what does this mean for the plant-based diet crowd and their insistence on ethical eating? Uh, with me now, I'm very pleased to say, is it's another ad, I think a better ad there. Ed Winters, who goes by Earthling Ed, is a vegan activist. How are you? I'm very well, Patrick. How are you? Okay, right. So can you talk me through this? Now, we did check. Yeah. I did check earlier whether or not it was going to offend you if we had some tomatoes in front of you and if I did remove them from their stem. You said no. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we kind of misrepresented the report a little bit. Right. The word scream isn't cited in the report. Okay. Either it's the word pain or sentience or suffering. <laughs> really, all we discovered was that plants will release certain popping sounds due to what they believe is cavitation, which is basically the releasing of gas. So much like bacteria also emit right. frequencies, so do plants as well. But it doesn't mean that they suffer off field pain. So they don't suffer off field pain because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are, are concerned about now for people who are not wanting to eat meat for ethical reasons. Yeah. You know, there are these occasional reports that seem to pop up about potentially, you know, plants being able to communicate with each other or feel things, etc. What's your view on that then? Do you think that plants can feel things? No, they have a subjective experience, which is what sentience is, which is what you and I have and indeed yeah. animals have as well. They're intelligent, of course, but so are bacteria and viruses. They're also intelligent. Uh with me in the studio now is someone who proved to be a fan favourite last time when we were talking bizarrely about tomatoes that don't scream. It's vegan educator. It's Ed Winters, also known by some as Earthling Ed. How are you? I'm very well, Patrick. It's good to see you again. Do you care about whether or not Queen Camilla holds a bit of ivory? The, the argument for using this will be, this is a, a tradition that dates back, I've got the date here, to the, uh, 1685 it yeah. was made, and, and then it was uh, used after that. So if people will say, look, this is just tradition. This elephant has been dead a very long time. Sure and possibly doesn't care about the whole thing anymore. Why not just use it? It looks nice. It is part of tradition. Well, it's about protecting other animals from also being turned into ivory. And also, I guess the question of tradition was always one of, of morality. You know, is something ethical and moral simply because it's traditional? I mean, mm. I know we had a little back and forth last yes. time. I'd love yeah. to maybe pose that question to you then. I mean, obviously it is traditional, but does that in and of itself make it ethical? Hi, James. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Too. Yeah, my name is Ed. Ed. Today I am at the Arizona State University in Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. with a banner that says, give me your best argument for not being vegan. Okay. You've kindly sat down. Thank you. What is your response to that? The food chain. But I do appreciate your time very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So what is your reasoning for not being vegan? I like the way it tastes. Okay. But, and, I, and I'm not morally good. Yeah. So, uh, so by that implication then, mm -hmm. oh, no. we can do anything we want to an animal as long as we enjoy it, and that's fine because we can't be morally pure. Sure. Do you see any potential concerns around that? 
you know. So what's your position now? I'm still gonna eat meat. For what reason? I, I like the way it tastes. I'm s so. I don't ask you the same questions over and over again, but I do appreciate your time very much. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. Nice thank you so much for, for sitting down and talking to me. Uh, you've been patiently waiting, so yeah. I appreciate that. There's a banner here yes. that says, can you justify not being vegan? You've come sit down with me, so presumably there's something that you have in your mind that maybe justifies not being vegan. Yes. A protein. Delight talking to you. Yeah, it was delight talking to you too. Have a great day. You too. And enjoy, uh, enjoy your life. I'll probably thank never you so see much. you again, you but uh, I'll, take it easy. I'll come back around here sometime. Perfect. Thank you so much for your conversation. You're welcome. Thanks for the polite debate. I appreciate it. Take care. Time now for our regular Listen Up segment where we debate an issue of public interest. Tonight we're looking at veganism. There was a time when a plant-based diet was the preserve of a tiny minority of people. But in recent years it's boomed in popularity. Tonight's proposition comes from Ed Winters, who's an author and vegan educator. And Ed joins us to debate his arguments with the beef and sheep farmer Martin Kennedy, who's president of the National Farmers Union Scotland. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Um, Ed, to you first of all, um, you say that animal farming, um, the, the animal farming industry is outdated and violent. Is that really the case? I mean, absolutely it is. When we look at animal suffering and animal harm and indeed animal death, no other industry on the planet causes more unnecessary suffering and harm to animals than the animal farming industries. And so it is definitely a violent industry. Uh, Martin, what's your response to that? It's outdated, violent, and it causes unnecessary harm to animals. It's, yeah, it's such a shame that we're seeing or hearing such a, a, an ill-informed, uh, blinkered approach to this. That's not the case at all. We, if we were to treat um, animals in the way that we're actually treating human beings in society just now, and I'm not just talking about the, the situation we have in Ukraine, but we treat human beings in a serious manner just now, we would be locked up if we treated um, uh, animals in the way we're actually treating people in society right now. You know, we need people to have food, we need people to have water and shelter. That's not happening in many parts of society just now. We, we are proud of our animal health and welfare standards in Scotland and the whole of the UK we will have and we've we're rightly claimed to have some of the highest animal health and welfare there is right across the world and we look after our animals for a good reason. I mean Ed, what, what, what evidence have you got to suggest that it's outdated and violent? I mean Martin's saying it's, it's you know the, the UK standards are excellent. Well, I mean, Martin says that we wouldn't do things to humans that we do to animals, but we do put animals in gas chambers. In fact, 90% of the pigs in the UK are killed in gas chambers where they're gassed to death using an aversive concoction of carbon dioxide. On top of that, of course, all the other animals we kill, we kill at a fraction of their lifespan by cutting their throats. We selectively breed animals so that they reach slaughter weight like chickens in six weeks and die of organ failure and ammonia from the farms that they are kind of kept in, burns their eyes, and even can cause blindness. So actually, no, the way that we treat humans in society is significantly better because we don't gas humans in the UK. And of course, we don't put them to, into slaughterhouses at six months old or 18 months old in the case of beef cattle and, and cut their throats. M Martin, do you want to respond to that? Because what, what Ed's describing is, her is horrific. <laughs> Yeah, it is absolutely horrific. That's not, that is, this is not this is not the case at all. I and mean, when you look at the, the welfare that's done through abattoirs that's carried out now, we're not the same as what happens maybe in some other parts of the world. That is not happening here. Um, and we rely on that readily source of protein, zinc, iron, vitamin B12 that is readily available through red meat. And we, 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 we need that, meat, that source of red meat to be there for the benefit of our health, for the benefit of the climate, for the benefit of biodiversity. The backdrop that's behind me is not like that for no reason. That's been a managed landscape with livestock for you know hundreds of years. That's why it's there. We have a tremendous biodiversity in Scotland. Yes, we can do more. We've got to do more to address climate change. But the reality is when Ed's talking about emissions, he's also incorrect there as well, because the way the emissions is calculated, biogenic methane that's, that's emitted by not just animals, um, but it's also emitted by decaying uh, plants as well. That biogenic methane is actually recycled back into the ground where it originally came from. So methane, although albeit okay. is more damaging when it's in the atmosphere it's only there for for about 12 to 15 years and that carbon that methane breaks down to carbon and water and sequester back okay. into the soil where it originally came from yeah i mean ed what's your response to that martin saying it's, it's not detriment it's not it's not causing a damage to the environment or as much as people say well firstly when the methane's in the environment that's when it's causing the warming and that methane wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the existence of the animals in the first place so that biogenic carbon cycle that martin's describing is, is, is utterly nonsense to be honest with you because the global warming happens when it's in the environment. 
But I also just want to go back to what Martin was saying, because Martin was saying that things that I described happening to animals don't happen here. And I'm absolutely shocked to hear that the head of the Scottish National Farmers Union could lie so blazingly and so boldly on television, because everything I've just described, or I described in that moment, is standard practice in the UK. That figure about 90% of pigs being killed in gas chambers comes from DEFRA. So I'm not sure how Martin could deny the existence of the things that I described when they are standard legal practices outlined by the UK government okay. and outlined by even the National Farmers Union, who he right. supposedly well, represents. Ma let Martin respond to that accusation, please. Martin. What I, what I was arguing was that you were saying this is a brutal way of, of slaughter. That is not the case. Every every possible thing is done for the benefit of the animal's welfare in, in a slaughterhouse. And we've got some of the best slaughterhouses in the world. And that's okay. done. And the reason they're gassed, that's done. And they were stunned for that reason. So that there is no, um, so that the benefit of the animal welfare is absolutely paramount, and we've been okay. driven to do that for a long, long but, time now, and we're actually proud Ed, to do that. Ed, want... Ed, hang on a second. Let, let's move on to some other areas of the argument. What about the fact that there's so many jobs are dependent on the the animal farming industry uh, in the UK, Ed? Well, firstly, I don't think that we could ever say that gas chambers are a pleasant way to be killed. But beyond that point, there are also other ways that we can find employment. Dude, fuck off. Insane. I don't want anything to do with you. Don't ever speak to me again. You're a fucking piece of shit. Even vegans don't get your weird, stupid, wannabe sense of irony here. Who is your audience? Nobody gets these dumb jokes. Dude, 